Who is this woman we honor tonight? She is a woman who believes in the revolutionary act of reading. A librarian at the Schomburg taught her that. She is a woman who knows about building cultural communities and black studies programs from New York to California and back again. She is a woman who won't remain silent when witness to truth is salvation. She and a band of grandmothers risked jail in Philadelphia because the truth about the war had to be told. She is a woman who's a peacemaker, inspiring peace murals and peace benches all over the city of brotherly love. She is a woman who will resist anyone or anything that threatens to take away our humanity. For she is the keeper of our human values. She is a mother, poet, playwright, teacher, activist, sister, friend. She is complex, yet so simply real. She is bad. This Birmingham-born, New York-bred woman with razors in her teeth. She is a singer in syncopated rhythms, channeling our ancestors, making our traditions come alive in her words. Who is this woman? Well, let me just say it the way she might say it, intensifying her adjectives with adverbs to make her point clearly clear. You know she does that. So, on behalf of the Furious Flower Poetry Center and Split This Rock, and the National Poetry, the National Portrait Gallery. It should be Poetry Portrait Gallery. <laughs> Please help me to bring to the stage the beautifully beautiful, spiritually spiritual, bravely brave, amazingly amazing, Sonia Sanchez. What an honor it is to be in this beautiful, beautiful site where many of these amazing portraits finally are about some black folks. <laughs> and we thank you for that. We thank you finally for that vision. I have on my jacket a button that says resist. And we all need to resist, but we need to do it seriously now. Seriously serious. Because these are very dangerous times we are now living in. We thought Bush and Reagan and Nixon, and I lived through those people. So some of the young people have come up to me and said, what do you do, 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 because we have Trump. I said, it's the same person, just a little bit louder. And you need to look up in the dictionary, I have it in my book, Trumpery. Have you looked it up? Hand me my, Marani, would you mind handing me my, my inside? I looked it up for you because I started a long piece called Trumpery. Now I just hope that I'm following what I usually do when I do this. I usually put it on a page at the end of the month. And that month when I discover something, here it is, January 31st, every now and then. You know, I'm 82 now, people, so you gotta understand. At some point, I lose some of this stuff. 
But I always tell people when you can't bring up a name, and many of you understand because I've said it to, um, you know, Sister Joyce and Sister Sarah and Sister Joanne, Sister Brenda, just say to your brain, I want that information in 15 minutes. <laughs> no, really. And it'll come. Because you get, you know, we have so much up there now in our 70s and 60s and 50s, you can't pull it up right away. And so therefore it takes 15 or 20 minutes to get it. But I do want to thank the Smithsonian National Portrait Gallery and Split This Rock and the Furious Flower Poetry Center. And I want to thank all the poets who came up. Um, I've seen them at some of the workshops and I've listened to them and I smile because we need to always make sure that we have the poets. You know, whether we agree or disagree, that's never the point. The point is that you write, you write, and you write, and you resist, and you resist, and you resist. In the dictionary, trumpery means showy but worthless finery. That's how it begins, and then it continues. Nonsense, rubbish, deception, trickery, fraud. From old French tromperie to cheat. Look it up. And I know some of you always wonder why you bring me places. You say you disrupt the National Gallery. No, I don't. The National Gallery is here with some amazing people. I've come in this place quietly, quiet quiet and looked at some of these portraits. Some of them who did not understand what it meant to have Africans among them. You know that? Some of them who decided to enslave people and said nothing about our death and our dying. But one of the great things about being a poet and one of the great things about being an African-American poet <laughs> is that you spill things. <laughs> it's okay, honey. Oh, thank you. That's my son, Marani, one of my twins. I just want to, I did a piece called The Centennial of Langston and Nicholas Guillen. I traveled to Cuba for an international writers' conference in the late 70s. After I had read a paper to an appreciative audience, <clears throat> some of the organizers asked me if I wanted anything. I said, yes, I'd like to meet Nicholas Guillen. They hesitated, said he was not feeling well, told me they would attempt to arrange the meeting. Two hours later, they gathered me up, and as I entered his office, he was standing in the middle of the room, feet planted on Cuban earth, legs no longer strong, but arms strong like Elizabeth Catlin's black women's arms. He said, Sonia, Sonia Sanchez, como Langston, como Langston Hughes. And I smiled, a smile of recognition, folded myself into his arms, and he held me so hard that I couldn't breathe, and I thought, hold it. I didn't come all this way just to die in Cuba. Then I realized that if I just stopped struggling, leaned into his breath, I would be okay. I leaned into his breath and we began to breathe as one. That is what Langston Hughes' poetry, plays, short stories taught us, the necessity to learn to lean into each other's breath and breathe as one. So listen, listen, gentle persons. I come to you this afternoon with two voices. I come to praise this man, this brother, this genius, this holy man, this weaver of words threading silver and gold into our veins. I come with the voice of the praiser. I come with the voice of the poet. I come to you to praise this man who gave us his eyes and we shone, became perennial, who piloted us into the slow bloodstream of America. And we tagged behind, walking on tiptoes, heard his words like jazz, like blues, like seculars agitating, keeping us on the edge of ourselves, breathing in our own noise, and we became small miracles. Something 
Underneath your hands, Langston man, something mighty, something human, something radical in your hands, accenting our blue flesh, observing us in a familiar city called Harlem, New York, the world, where we return as birth, blood, water, death, where we became traveling men and women, turning corners, moving like black trains across the country, landless men and women, immortal in our moving, living with nothing, dying from everything. And when you said, Astro Mama, and we attempted to do so, the country turned over in its blood, said, what mama, mammy, sapphire, Aunt Jemima, you talking about? Said, who your mama is, is my mammy. And all your mama stood still, blowing back black in the wind. Thank you. And you gave us early morning names, Madam Alberta K. Johnson, Jess B. Simple, Susanna Jones, Scottsboro Boys, Gillian, Lorca, Lumumba, Nkrumah, Fidel, Nasser, Bebop Men, Imploding Spaces, and How to Resist in the Quarter of the Negroes. You gave us the still Harlem air, the darker brother star, the Christ in Alabama sky, the knowledge that we were two nations under one America. So much life coursing through your pages, man. So many vacancies filled by your eyes, man. You made us figure out the humor in tragedy, the tragedy in humor, taught us what we were really missing in our lives while we live 20 years and 10. You knew already that we make our history, but only so much of it as we are allowed to make. So listen, gentle men, gentle women, pull your hearts out of your armpits, get your tuxedos out of mothballs, Put your long red dress on, girl, and snap your breasts into place as we go dancing on Langston Hughes' tongue, living, speaking, without a crutch. This is his centennial, his birthday. Tonight is a political act. Oh, yes. Oi, al legado. It is today. Today has arrived. Oh, it's oi, al legado. It's de mañana. Today is today. Tomorrow has arrived. Woke up this morning with my eyes on Langston. I say woke up this morning with my eyes on Langston. Woke up this morning with my eyes on Langston. Gonna live, gonna love, gonna resist just like him. And you can't ask your mom about that. You got to do it yourself. Ask yourself, can I resist? Can I resist for Langston? Woke up this morning with my eyes on Langston. Say, woke up this morning with my eyes on Langston. Woke up this morning with my eyes on Langston. Gonna live, gonna love, gonna resist, 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 resist. just like him. That's for Langston. You know, I had this long interview in France, and one of the people asked me if he had to do it over again, would you just write poems? and not write stuff that would incite and make people angry. Make a whole country angry at you sometimes, you know. We the black arts poets, you know that. Because so many of you decided you weren't right like us. <laughs> I heard that, oh yeah. We are not going to write like you because you got in trouble. Because you know, you had difficulties in America. And that is so true, we did have difficulties in America. But you know, my sisters and my brothers, that's what you do in this country. That's what you do in a country that will bring you here as Africans and turn you into Negroes and to niggers, you know, and to aunties and mammies. That's what you do in this place called America. You write and you question and you challenge. You know, we want to blame everything on Trump. That is not true. What you got to understand is that the 1% of the people who run the world got Trump into office. 
And they said, we will get Trump into office because the Democrats are punks, many of them. You know, if it had not been for our dear brother in the Congress who got up and said simply, I'm going to resist this president, most of the Democrats would have gone along and said, by golly, by gee, here we are. We need people to begin to say simply, this is really our country. This is really our land. We got to stand up and say something. Don't tell me you're afraid of your job. We've always been afraid of a job. I travel across America, people. You know that? My father used to say to me, if you just shut up, Sonia, you could get tenure. Just shut up. Just teach. And I said, Daddy, if I shut up, I can't teach. You see, I was blessed. to meet some people in my time who make me understand that I can never be a fool on the stage. I can never lie on the stage, people. When you meet Robeson, when you meet Du Bois and his wife Shirley, when you meet Queen Mother Moore, when you meet Jean Hudson, who was the curator at the Schomburg, who sat me down one day in the Schomburg and gave me three books. I had answered an ad in the New York Times, and the ad, they needed a writer for their firm. And I sent this letter out in my CV, and I got a telegram. They don't do telegrams anymore. I got a telegram on a Saturday that said, report to work on Monday, you are hired. I took that, that telegram and got in my father's face and said, see, 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 I can get a job writing. And my father looked at me and said, uh-huh. Are you going to show up? I said, yes. And I showed up. They said, show up at 9 o'clock. I got there at 8.30. I was not going to do the CP time. And I heard coming down the hallway the click, click, click of heels and this young woman. And she said, yes, can I help you? And I took the telegram out of my purse and handed it to her. And she looked at the telegram and she looked at me and she looked at the telegram and she looked at me, and she looked at the telegram, and she looked at me, and she opened the door and said, come in and have a seat. And you know those old typewriters, she took off the, the, the cover, that leather cover, and set, got her desk all settled. Then she went through a door and disappeared. And about 10 minutes to nine, she came back and sat down and started to type. And then a face came up around the door and went back and another face came around the door and finally a guy came out and said, yes, can I help you? And I handed him the telegram and he looked at the telegram and he looked at me and he looked at the telegram and he looked at me and he looked at the telegram and he looked at me and said, the job is taken. I said, oh, oh, I got it, I got it. You know, I'm from New York, New York humor. I said, I got you here too early. You said, come at nine o'clock, I'm gonna go out the door and come back at nine o'clock and everything should be all right. And he said, lady, the job is taken. And I said, I got it, it's prejudice. You're, you know, you're discriminating against me. I'm gonna report you to the Urban League and the guy shrugged his shoulder and went in the back. And I got on the train in New York City and those of you know, if you get on that train, if you go on the number one train, you stay on the west side. If you get on the number two or three, you're going to end up on the east side. And the door closed at 95th Street, and I realized that the train was shaking. I don't know if it was shaking because it was going to Harlem, but it was shaking. And it finally let me off at 135th Street. And I got off in front of the Harlem Hospital, crossed the street, and got a, a quarter, quarter in the block, and looked up, and the sign said, the Schomburg. And the guy was I said, smoking real fast. And I said, what is the Schomburg? He said, lady, go inside, sign in. Go inside and you'll see. And she's in a, a, in a glass door. And I signed in and went in. And I went in and there was a table from about there to about here. And nothing but scholars sitting there with books stacked high, with their heads down, and a glass door. And I knocked on the door. And Miss Hudson came and said, yes, my, yes. And I told her my name. I said, what is this, Schomburg? She said, oh, my dear. Oh, my dear. This is a library that has books only by and about Negroes. And with my fresh 19 and a half year old mouth, I said, there must not be many books in here. Uh -huh. She never let me forget that. 
Every time I brought my students from Amherst College, Temple University, you know, um, New York City to the Schomburg to study all day long, she says, I have a story to tell you about your professor. <laughs> and you know how your students are. They turn and say, I got some on you. <laughs> all right. And indeed, they did have something on me. She sat me down, made room for me at that table, and 20 minutes later, she brought me three books, Souls of Black Folk, Up From Slavery, and their eyes were watching God. No. You know, I started to read, and you know, we, these educated blacks, my ears, mouth, teeth had to get accustomed to the black English. It is not dialect, it is black English, those of you who teach, okay? Until I got accustomed to the black English, and then I eased up and knocked on the door, and I said, what's your name again? <laughs> and she said, Miss Hudson, I said, how could I be an educated woman and not read this? She said, oh my dear, I'm gonna give you lots of books. Let's go to sit down and read some more. So I went and sat down, eased in, and I read some more, and I started to sob. I didn't cry, I sobbed. There's a difference between crying and sobbing. And I got up and knocked on the door again. I said, no, 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 no. I just graduated from Hunter College. How could I have not read this? She said, oh my dear, I'm gonna give you many, many books. And as I sat down this time and tried to, this African scholar said, Miss Hudson, Tell this young woman, either she sits still or she has to leave. And I didn't look for a job for the rest of the summer. I came to the Schomburg and she fed me every book that was in there. And I sat and I read, and then she sent me to Mr. Michelle, and Mr. Richard Moore. When he didn't give me shopping bags, he gave me bags of books, these black books. I said, I don't have any money. They said, that's all right, Miss Hudson told us about you. And when Miss Hudson was dying, some years later, I went to her, her house and I held her hand. I said, what did you see in me? What made you take the time? She said, oh my dear, I knew that you were one of the ones that would teach this. I am so grateful for that woman, for that sister, for that scholar who taught me and gave me this literature that you young people must continue, that you young people must continue and stop, 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 stop arguing amongst yourself about who's the best. We're all good. There's no such thing as the best the best poet on the planet Earth. No, 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 no. Stop, the, just receive each other. Receive the words, relish the words, love the words, understand at some point that we're all moving in the same, same fashion. Some of us say the words differently, but the point is that it's all about love, is it not? You are a wonderful audience. Thank you for being here and we, we want to bid you a good night and safe travels home. <laughs>